Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We keep saying this day after day after day. Today we are going to be talking about eternal recurrence and I'm delighted to have Mr. Nietzsche, Dan himself here. So Dan, take it away. All right. Um, welcome all. Uh, I am Dan. I run uh, the Denver Philosophy Club. I've studied Nietzsche over 20 years. I've read all of his works many times over. I'm familiar with his works. So um, I've kind of stepped in to play the substitute uh, of Nietzsche so that we can uh, read his ideas and then try to engage with uh, his text as if it was a living text. So um, I wanted to kind of read these two fun quotes uh, before we jump on into it. <clears throat> From Woody Allen, this is out of the film, Hannah and Her Three Sisters. And Nietzsche with his, his theory of the eternal recurrence, he said that life we lived, we're going to live over again the exact same way for an eternity. Great, that means I'll have to sit through the ice capades again. The second quote is from Nietzsche, animals as critic. I fear that the animals consider man as a being like themselves that has lost the most dangerous way it sounds, it, it, it sound animal common sense. They consider him an insane animal, a laughing animal, a weeping animal, a miserable animal. So with that said, let's try to consider what Nietzsche's primary theory is in his philosophy. And we'll try to figure out where exactly Nietzsche falls in his theory. So Nietzsche has fundamentally three different types of critiques. And I've titled them the reason critique, the value critique, and the subject orientation critique. Uh, the reason critique that we live in a rational, we're rational beings and inside a rational universe. The second is the value critique, that the value of life must be con uh, confined to the limits of our existence. Uh, no values beyond our own existence, like the afterworldly, otherworldly, those kinds of things. Uh, more importantly in this critique, that values are subjective and that there's no such thing as an objective or natural value. The third is subject orientation critique, that our lives are value orientated and without any kind of adherence to some set of values or other, human life would be virtually impossible. This is essentially Nietzsche's own theory. And uh, today we're gonna go over the eternal recurrence and we're going to see how um, that theory fits in between the three critiques that Nietzsche outlands. So without further ado, let's get into some Nietzsche. Uh, yes, there it is. The greatest heavy weight. What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you in your loneliness loneliest of loneliness and say unto you, this life that you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live it once more and at innumerable times more. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain, every joy, every thought, every sigh, everything unutterably small and great in your life will have to return to you all in the same succession and sequence. Even this spider, this moonlight between the trees, even this moment and I myself, the eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again and again. And with it, you, with it, you speck of dust. Did you not throw yourself down, gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered, you are a God and I've never heard anything more divine. If this thought gained possession of you, it would change you for who you are and perhaps even crush you. The question in each and every thing, do you desire this once more and innumerable times more, would lie upon the actions of your actions as the greatest weight. How well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal? Excellent. So folks, this is an interactive um, interactive presentation. So go ahead and type an exclamation mark. And um, we can, uh, the, so we've got four rules. Number one, 
type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to speak. Rule number two, keep on topic. We're talking about eternal recurrence. Okay, so let's keep on eternal recurrence. The idea of eternal recurrence is what we're talking about. Number three, be brief. And number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anything, anybody on anything and do so courteously. So we're going to start uh, with, uh, so these are questions only on eternal recurrence, okay? So it's going to be uh, George, Joe, and Phil. George, what's your question? Well, you know, I'm listening to what you just read, and thank you very much. What does the idea of all men, women are created equal? What, what in, that, in the context of what you just wrote, and read rather, uh, what does that idea mean? All men, women are created equal. Thank you, George. Um, Nietzsche would tell you that no one is equal and that there's no such thing as equality. Uh, he would also say that uh, that doesn't mean that we lose our sense of humanism in the way that we can treat each other with a certain uh, humane decency. It just means that not everybody starts at the same starting point in the race and thus their dispositions are different. And more importantly, Nietzsche believes that human beings are defined by their character or their disposition. So there might be an angry disposition or a calm disposition or an adventurous disposition. Nietzsche wants to get his reader to accepting their disposition, their character. Uh, Nietzsche would say, what does your conscience tell you? You shall become who you really are. That's what your conscience should tell you. Wonderful, but uh, the, the point that George brought up is a critical point and we'll keep coming to it. Well, what we're going to do is that we are now number, we are on number four of Nietzsche's ideas. We're going to do one more idea and that is his view of uh, values next time. And then we're going to do two sessions on bringing everything together, okay? so keep pursuing all the values because we are looking at Nietzsche as a whole and we are looking at specific topics uh, together. So we'll have multiple ways, uh, you know, multiple opportunities to come back to this. Next up is going to be Joe, Phil, James, Allison, and Laura. Joe. Um, thank you, Mr. Nietzsche. Uh, so I've heard eternal recurrence used in two different like kind of circumstances. One is a potentially as a cosmological type of theory. And then the other is a practical theory of how to look at your life, which is the right one, if there is one. And then what is the cosmological theory? Because I really never understood it. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, Nietzsche wrote in what we might consider as a style of hyperbole. So the correct kind of rendering of the idea of the eternal recurrence is that your life, your existence is contingent on cycles and that these cycles in your life repeat themselves. Now, where you're unaware of it in the kind of Marx sense, we play with Marx, I'm not a Marxian, but in the way that you're unconscious of these cycles, you might not be in control of your existence. Rather, your disposition is in control of it. And so Nietzsche's idea, in essence, to try to give you an appropriate interpretation of the eternal recurrence. If I should highlight the title of the Gay Science uh, 341, the greatest heavyweight. That is, Nietzsche looks at the eternal recurrence as an existential test. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this existential test and just bear with me with the, the narrative components of it. Uh, it will help. Um, I'm 21 years old, unfortunately I'm not. I just turned 21 today. My father, he was an alcoholic. He began drinking at five. My grandfather, he too is an alcoholic. My great grandfather, alcoholic. Everyone in my family, in all my history, all alcoholics, all booze hounds, all addicted personalities. I know this. 
I go into a bar for my 21st birthday. I purchase my first alcoholic beverage. And I know, I know that once I do this, my fate is over. I'm going to become a drunkard. Now, this is what Nietzsche's test is designed to do. Notice when the demon says, you're going to have to repeat everything you are over and over and over and over for an eternity. In doing that, he's talking about your habit in the way that you have no control over it. It's part of your disposition in one state where you're unconscious about it. So what he wants us to move is from a state of regret to a state of uh, being in a state of sublime sublimity. And the whole point of the eternal recurrence is to build what he calls an intellectual conscience. And this is a very difficult thing or task as he puts it. In the beginning of the gay science, subselection number two, Nietzsche says that the whole point of all of his work is to confront the subject who reads him and say, this conscience you have, that's a reaction from guilt. It is weak, it is useless, and at worst, it gives you nothing more than bad teeth as you chew on stones like dogs do. I want to give you something strong, something that will make you mightier. And so where does he look? Well, he looks to the Stoics who have the same belief. He looks to the Hindu Indians who have the same belief about fate. It's about accepting whatever bad components of your disposition are. If you were born to be an alcoholic in the way of going, well, I'm not responsible enough to prevent my fate, so I won't choose this choice. I will use my conscience in forethought rather than in insight. I will take command over myself and learn how to guide myself by choosing a yes or no, a straight line or a goal. That is what Nietzsche's thesis is about. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Phil, James, Allison, Laura, and Jyoti. Phil. Uh, Phil, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Nietzsche, I, I'm not sure if I understood what you said, but it seems to me I would think that to make myself as unintellectual uh, intellectual as possible. So when I come back again, I would discover these things over and over again and be just thrilled that I discover these things because I have forgotten that I discovered it before. And so therefore I'm discovering a fresh and a new, and therefore our life would never be boring over and over again. Now I'm assuming also that I must have discovered this from another life already, and I'm living it now, and think that I have discovered these things that you said to me, and it's thrill to learn these things so that I could uh, think this is new and fresh, and this is just thrilling. Because one thing I'm most afraid of is I would be bored out of my gore once I end up discovering everything and there's no more to discover then what I'm gonna do. I mean, so, so that's what I would do if that's truly a deal. Mr. Nietzsche, would you like to comment on that? Thank you, Phil. As Nietzsche, I want you to think about your life in the way of ruminating about your possibilities. In the way that if you've chosen to not become, let's say an addict, to ruminate as to what kind of addict you would be as you live the other kind of life, the non-addictive life. So in some ways, your life will be idealistic in contemplation about considering contingencies that could change and reshape your life. That is, you'll begin to look 
at everything as a miracle, then you'll start thinking that things are about timing. If I was too early and when I turned that corner, I missed that person. If I was too late, uh, I turned the corner and bumped into the wrong person. That, that everything really comes into whether or not I've done something with the correct timing. That is what is ideal about the eternal occurrence, is that as an idea, it's meant to ground you and get you away from the liberation of the death of God. It's designed to ground you and give you conscience so that you will think that every single action or inaction you choose in your life will now have the greatest heavy weight upon you as opposed to every action has an arbitrary light uh, weight where there is no weight whatsoever. He wants all of your actions in the past and all of your potential actions of now to take on a heavy weight because you will have to choose it again. That means every error, every correct choice that you've made in your life, you will have to choose again how do you become gay towards that idea? Now, note, I understand most of us think about the term gay in the way that uh, of uh, 1960s Australian slang that refers to homosexuality. Nietzsche is not thinking about gay this sense. He's thinking of the troubadours who were the gayest of all people. Even though they lived in squalor and terrible suffering, they performed art for other people so that they could be enlivened by that action. And this is what Nietzsche has in mind. He wants us to have a gay conscience. How do you acquire that? You acquire that by confronting your regret and overcoming it. By confronting what your disposition is, knowing what you're really good at, knowing what you're not. That is what the core of this idea is designed for. Wonderful. Thank you. Next up is James. Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah, Mr. Nietzsche. Um, thanks for returning again. Um, this, uh, you know, this uh, eternal return idea, I, I can understand it as a kind of uh, ethical um, you know, idea that um, that he's uh, encouraging, you know, uh, one's uh, certain attitude towards uh, toward one's faith. But you know, if, if you're saying that that uh, that he's asserting that we're rational beings in an irrational universe, then uh, it seems to me that the eternal return is attributing something rational in the in the universe, and that seems to be. A, a contradiction to what he's originally saying about uh, rational being in an irrational universe. Beautiful question. Thank you. Thank you, James. So this is a very good question. And what I want to do is come back to the point that Nietzsche is using. Nietzsche is using the eternal recurrence as a term that's written in hyperbole. The more appropriate way to look of it is that our lives are defined by cycles. There, that you will have a morning, a noon, and an evening. And this repeats itself, that, that everything about our existence is confined by this pattern of cycles. Nietzsche wants us to stop thinking that time is linear. And there's a particular reason why he wants us to do that, because he wants us to be able to live in a yes and a no state in what you might think of as an, a contradictive state where you're able to say yes and no. The reason why he wants us to do this is because uh, Nietzsche's anti-Christian. He thinks that the idea of linear time is a product of Christendom and that uh, Christendom was anti-cyclical about time. And so he chose the idea of a, a view that time is cyclical that the, the Persians had it, the Indians had it, the ancient Greeks had it, the Egyptians had it. This was a popular idea throughout that portion of the world in history. Why did that idea go away? Nietzsche thinks that it went away because of the monopoly that monotheism 
uh, brought in the way that it, it washed out the kind of power and plurality that culture really offered the human subject. And so if you only were able to go to one source for your own spiritual uh, needs, this idea that time is linear uh, says that, that God uh, didn't die even though he was crucified, that God lives on even though God was crucified in this way, historically. That is, God died and God lived. But guess what Christendom is trying to say to you? God never died. God is alive and, and well today. God has thrived. And this is the only history we have. We have no other plurality of history but this history. And so Nietzsche is attacking that idea from several fronts. And what he wants us to do, again, um, we're rational beings living in an irrational universe. Well, the eternal recurrence says that time, that time forward is an eternity and time backward was an eternity. And that now, the now that you exist in is just nearly the smallest, slimmest slice of an eternity. And so you are incredibly small in this. There is no rhyme or reason. The only thing that you can enjoy are the cyclical patterns for which science is derived from, for which uh, most of our experiential consciousness derives from, like uh, your, uh, what is it, circadian clock, et cetera. All of these, these biological things that we take for granted about our unconscious, all of those things are a product of the cycles of our own existence. And so Nietzsche doesn't want us to, to try to think of this idea like, well, I'm gonna to have to come back and do the ice capades all over again. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to exaggerate the weight of your decisions. It's an existential test. Wonderful. Um, Mr. Nietzsche, I'm gonna ask a follow-up question. Um, several philosophers talk about the value of principles, universal principles that you can apply at all times. And they focus on, for example, one of my favorite thinkers, Louis Sullivan, he says, I have found that only the universal principles are the most valuable principles. And they try to discover these principles which are applicable all the time. So you can be applying that principle all the time. So it's not a concrete repetition, but it's a repetition of, of an idea, a repetition of a principle. Uh, is that something that is consonant with what your idea of eternal recurrence is? Or is it something completely different? Or is it somewhere in between? I wrote um, a lot of my unpublished notes um, throughout my life that was republished The Will to Power. I experimented with that idea that the eternal recurrence was meant to be some kind of cosmology. I, I posited that any finite amount of energy would be related to an infinite, uh, uh, an infinite source of energy. And so the combinations, even though they're infinite, they could repeat themselves energetically because reality is lazy. But Nietzsche abandons this approach. Um, Arthur Danto, who was a pretty good Nietzsche interpreter, uh, Nietzsche's philosopher, a wonderful book, he provides a proof in his chapter called The Eternal Recurrence. He provides a proof that shows that Nietzsche's idea was a complete failure. That is, there's no such thing as a cosmological interpretation of this idea. Uh, this is something that most idealistic metaphysicians have a tendency to try to attach themselves to. Martin Heidegger did it, uh, Michel Foucault, uh, Derrida, uh, post-structuralists. Uh, you can name uh, a litany of, of parties who have tried to do this. Um, this doesn't work for Nietzsche's own philosophy. If you, if you start considering uh, a, a number of things, like how much time did Nietzsche devote to his idea of the eternal recurrence? Well, maybe 1% out of the 100% of what he wrote. So why does that 1% stand out as an idea? Nietzsche has thousands of ideas 
thousands, more than just this eternal recurrence, this death of God, this will to power, this ubermensch, that truth is an illusion, it's just a phenomena that we invent, all of these ideas that are in Nietzsche. Why does the ubermensch stand out, even though the text is roughly about 2% out of the totality devoted to the idea to the ubermensch or the will to power, to the death of God? Why? Well, it's because most of Nietzsche's own modern interpreters often want to come out with the best impactful ideas that Nietzsche has. The problem with that is that these ideas are not presented or represented in a systematic way. But could I tell you that the death of God is really about cynicism rather than atheism? That there comes a point where you hear about uh, uh, religion, you realize that that's just not believable. Nothing they've said is believable. You become cynical and your ears are deaf to it, even though you know the other party deeply is devoted to it. That's a problem. Uh, here's another problem. Uh, if, your, if your moral value system caters to the lowest common denominator, that means it makes everybody smaller and smaller. If you decide to break with the herd in this, to try to do something great or powerful, the herd is going to hate you. And that only way that you can do it is to give up on their notions of good and evil. Because in some ways, these are short souls who can't see at the right heights the, the great ideals that one could strive for. Uh, when someone said, oh, Mount Everest is not conquerable, you can't walk up to the top of K2. What happened? Human beings went, Oh, no, 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 no. I want to get to the top of that mountain. I want to see what those limits are. I want to push it. You might have set up those limits. I'm going to find a way out of that. And so that is why we talk about the eternal recurrence, because what it's designed to do is it's designed to break your religious conscience into pieces and reassemble it with a modern sense of conscience. One that will, in, in, in the most Yiddish of Yiddish ways, uh, you know, that wonderful Yiddish thing that the wise avoid the very things that the clever have to get themselves out of. In that way where the conscience tells you be forward thinking, not backward thinking, not sideward thinking, even though he wants that part in us because he thinks that in order to really experiment, you have to live inside the yes and the no. You have to live in the indeterminism of your own actions and your potential. Wonderful, thank you. Next up is Allison, Laura, Jyoti, and Dave. Allison. Um, so I'm confused about this idea of, so if God is dead, but then you have eternal recurrence, because if you're living your life over and over again, that means there's an afterlife, which then, would mean that God exists so that they don't seem to gel. Um, and then my other thing is that if you're, the idea is that you wanna have um, change what you do so that when you're li living your life over and over again, it's better, but how could you possibly do that if you're living the same life over and over again, then you don't have any say in it. Do you see what I mean? Like logically, it doesn't make sense. So I just wanna see if you could explain that, please. Thank you very much, Allison. So what I would say is that the death of God frees the subject up from believing unbelievable things that set up the idea that there is life and an afterlife. And it says that all your values must be contained by the limits of your existence, not by the things that are outside those boundaries of your existence. Secondly, the eternal recurrence is introduced as an idea that's designed to ground the individual from their freedom. That is, if the death of God, the death of God gives you the freedom to break gravity, the eternal recurrence gives you the power to constrain yourself to keep you grounded. And that is its, I, that is its point, is designed to be as a counteractive so that instead of looking at life as something or existence as something wretched and ugly, you can now look at existence 
as artistic and beautiful. And that's what Nietzsche wants to get you to. Again, you have to take away the hyperbolic language of eternal and recurrence. Replace it with uh, cyclical patterns in my life that you don't have any control over. If you want to gain control over it, you have to accept your disposition towards that. The, similar to transference therapy, right? The, the, the child, his mom left him when he was a kid. So every time his girlfriend as his adult leaves him to go to work, he experiences unconscious transference. Oh, my mom left me alone and, and all the women that love me are going to abandon me. So this is what Nietzsche is trying to get us to do, to try to attack that idea of transference there. Why would I allow what I recognize as a pattern from my past to repeat and then ruin my current now? Why do I want to do that? Why, why do I want to live in regret? Why don't I have the power of choice to live in gaiety as opposed to regret? Who wants to live in regret when you have the power to get to gaiety? Thank you. Next up is going to be Laura followed by Jyoti. Laura. Okay. Um, I, I get all that, but I feel like you've had to bring that to us through your studies and through your translation. You bring a transparency to Nietzsche's thinking. I wonder, does the average person ever get to that understanding? It seems only the intellects understand this and can deal with it. The language has to be you know, um, interpreted so many ways and in, in, in so many directions. I just wonder what's the purpose of his thinking, you know? Is it just for him? I mean, do people, I mean, I'm sure there are people that gravitate to it, but what do they, what do, they do with it? You know, is this something that be, can become, you know, the, the thought of a mass of people? I mean, what, what's his purpose? Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that's a wonderful question. Uh, you're right. Uh, most of Nietzsche's work is rather transparent to me because I'm really familiar with it. And me presenting it this way, trying to take away the, the kind of mystique and mystery and drop it down to its bare bones, that the eternal recurrence is about responsibility and nothing else, is difficult. But not only that, but in the way that Schopenhauer thought that we have to take responsibility for all the cruelty in the world. We have to take moral responsibility for all the wickedness that goes on in our existence. Nietzsche is borrowing from that idea, saying that we have to take responsibility for our own, let's say, existential ecosystem. We have to take responsibility of our own modernity, our own condition. And that's a very hard pill to swallow because it means that you have to accept the fate that there are going to be small people, great people, people, uh, and that not only that, but there are going to be people who can't change. And there are gonna be people who are too filled with potential to change that they can't slow themselves down, that they're just perpetually evolving. So that when you look at the kaleidoscope of let's say disposition, about the human character, which is vast. The wonder of it all is that, can that disposition change? Can you change who you are? Now, the next idea that Nietzsche is entertaining is entertaining a way of solving that. That is, uh, if we have two different types of reactions to the eternal recurrence, one negative and, and one positive, how can I use another idea to get me more closer to the positive one to avoid the negative one? That is the hard one. And we'll get into that once I finish all our questions. Thank you. So what we're going to do folks is that we, I want to, we want to keep time for breakout rooms today. So we will do two more questions. Um, basically everybody who has a, uh, you know, questions for the first time, we'll take three more questions, Jyoti, Dave and Fad. And then we're going to go uh, move on to the next sections because I want to leave time for breakout rooms where people can discuss things with each other and then come back and ask the best question that, that they have after all that reflection. All right, next up is going to be uh, Jyoti. Jyoti, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Dan. 
uh, or Dr. Nisha, whatever you prefer to be called. <laughs> uh, good interpretation, I'm enjoying it. Now tell me, how is eternal recurrences uh, um, different than the nature's fractal patterns? They aren't. That's the same idea. That's what he was. In fact, Nietzsche was thinking about Julia sets when he was entertaining the eternal recurrence. He was thinking that cycles in our own life that we have a tendency to repeat ourselves. Um, so you're dead on. Yes. Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be Dave, followed by Fahad. Dave. Thanks, Shukan. Is my audio okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nietzsche, um, I know you've had physical problems, several infirmities that you're suffering from, obviously, but I praise you because you, that has not limited you. Have you produced great literature and done great things, but I can understand how repeating your life might be considered as punishment. We remember the phrase, all life is suffering, but some people have a good life. But uh, this theory of succession or recurrence reminds me of a movie of our time called Groundhog Day, where a man was cursed to repeat a day again and again and again, and he eventually became a better person. Would you like to comment, sir? Ah, uh, those artists, they, they did it right. Unfortunately, Bill Murray and his groundhog. Um, Yes, this is what I have as the idea, that while you are living a choice, you should be entertaining the other ones so that it improves you and so that you live not one life, but many, and an eternal life in this way, where you're able to explore all of your possibilities as you live the kind of life that's determined for you. Thank you. Next up is Fahad. Uh, Fahad, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, my, my question to you, Dr. thank you so much. So when you say like you have this recurrence and every time you got that situation we need, where you need to say yes or no, so based on which values and, and which principle you make that choice, because you can go with your feelings uh, or emotions uh, most of the time these things are not reliable and sometimes you go actually with your yeah feels actually um with pleasure which doesn't mean that actually it's is the right choice and and when you make these choices are you considering the whole society or you're just considering what's the best for your own self so does Nietzsche actually um, talk about based on what we supposed to make these choices and yes and no? Thank you very much, Dr. Fahad. Um, what I would say is, you're always going to interpret a safe choice and a risky one. And Nietzsche is trying to say that if you choose the conventionally safe one, it might even serve people as a whole. But if you don't ever consider the dangerous choice, the risky one, uh, you, will never, you will never outgrow your, your state of development for which you're stuck in the quicksand for who you are. That is, if you want to change your disposition, you have to choose riskier choices because those are the ones that are going to transform you. The unrisky ones are just going to be choices of repetition where you're going right back to the very conventions that have led you to the dead end for who you are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Nietzsche. Can we go to the next section? Yes.
All right. For the new year, I still live and I still think. I still have to live for I still have to think. Some ergo cognito, cognito ergo sum. Today, everybody permits himself the expression of his wish and his dearest thought. Hence, I too shall uh, say what it is that I wish from myself today. And what the first thought that runs across my heart this year? What thought shall I be for the reason and warranty and sweetness of my life henceforth? I want to learn more and more to see beautiful what is necessary in things. Then I shall become one of those who makes things beautiful. Amore fate, the love of fate, let that be my love henceforth. I do not want to wage war against what is ugly. I don't want to accuse. I don't even want to accuse those who accuse. Looking away shall be my only negation. And all in all, and all the wholesome day, I wish to be only a yes sayer. Um, can we go ahead and uh, the second passage is also about Amor Fate, right? Yes. So we are running short on time. So how about reading that passage and then taking all the questions about it and then we can go to breakout rooms so that leaves enough time for people to come back and ask questions. Indeed. All right. Or believe me, the secret for harvesting, harvesting from existence, the greatest fruitfulness and the greatest enjoyment is to live dangerously. Build your cities on the slopes of Vesuvius. Send your ships to uncharted seas. Live at war with your peers and yourself. Be robbers and conquerors as long as you cannot be rulers and possessors, you seekers of knowledge. Soon the age will be past when you could be content to live hidden in the forest like shy deer. At long last, the search for knowledge will reach out for its due. It will want to rule and to possess and you with it. Thank you. So um, folks, it's time for questions about this. So let me start by asking, um, I could not quite follow what you meant by Amor Fati. Could you go ahead and elaborate? Yes, the Stoics believe that all human life has been fated from its birth to its death and that it's taking part uh, in part a very vast complicated drama. Um, I, I believe the Indian Hindus believe that life is a drama. And so the Stoics see that too. But what they want to do is they want to have reason to rule over the will and the passions. And that was their way of doing that is um, by minimizing uh, the power of the complexity of your life in those patterns that you live by reducing it down to allowing only reason to let things in. Nietzsche doesn't like this idea. What he wants to do is he wants to usurp it. He wants to put passion and will on top of the idea of reason and to drive the individual towards uh, uh, reconsidering the value of reason when you look at how uh, the individual is compared um, to the vast universe. Well, thank you. Next up is Joe. Yeah, just a cl clarification, because I'm actually just looking at the passage itself right now. It seems very passive in it. Helps. There's a form of acceptance of what is, but you're actually talking about overcoming. Isn't there a, a little bit of a contradiction in a sense that you're accepting uh, your fate for what it is, but you're actually asking us to overcome our fate at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there's a modern idiom that we say, um, uh, the past is what it is, the future is what's to, to be, but the present is a gift for now. Um, if you begin to look at your, your past as if it were fated, like all the things that were uh, painful and joyful and instructive and humbling, all of these things 
are your fate. That is that you, you can't choose other choices in your existence now that the choices are up. How do you, as Edmund Burke say, uh, don't let the, the past bury the future or the present. How do you overcome that, that part of your fate? How do you get rid of it? Well, Nietzsche's answer is you begin to start saying yes to it. It happened. It's an acceptance thing. And it's a passive acceptance. It's like, yes, that sucked. All those terrible things in my own childhood, my young adulthood, et cetera, et cetera. All of that misery and suffering for what it's worth has made you who you are, that your disposition is a product of that experience, of all of that. And if you want to overcome that experience or overcome yourself this way, it starts by saying, I've never heard of anything so divine as you explaining that I'm gonna to have to relive this over and over again. Every pain and every joy and everything small and great, please, let's, let's get back on it. Let's do the ice capades several more times. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Laura. Laura, what's your question? Laura, you need to unmute. I was just going to question what he was saying about um, that part about um, reliving. I mean, I think that the Stoic would say, you know, what's over, it's done, just move on and pack it up and forget about it. And yeah, look at today for tomorrow. Um, and I can change all this. And it doesn't matter what my past was. Uh, you know, I know what it was. And I, I've lived it. I've done it. That's who I am today because of it. And now because of it, I can do these other things and I can make these improvements and I can move on and have a different future. So, I mean, what, Nietzsche just makes everything that's so natural, so complicated. And I, you know, I feel like he makes twists and turns and, you know, he's just looking at what life is, you know, and, <laughs> and I have so much difficulty in, you know, trying to unravel every time everything that he says when it comes down to something, at least in this generation, us and our time in the world we live in, seems like just, yeah, okay, that's the way it is, you know, and everybody has a different position in it. Some people will not be able to do that thing with their past and they have to wrestle with it, you know, but I'm just, you know, speaking from one perspective, um, one philosophy of, you know, how to deal with the past. But again, transparency, what good is he thinking if it's so heavy and so intense and so complicated? I, I mean, it seems to me- let, let Mr. Nietzsche defend himself. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, defend yourself. Thank you, uh, Laura. Uh, what I wanna say is um, if you forgive me for my romantic idealism and convoluting such very straightforward and simple things, um, perhaps if you think about it in the way that, let's start thinking of it as in from the 1860s. Most philosophers, when they began to develop their work, they padded it. So they might have two or three really good ideas, uh, just like the modern musical album, right? You might have three or four uh, one hit tracks, but you have 20 tracks. And so you pad all of it into one book and you sell it because who knows what's going to stick? Who knows, somebody's gonna read it and go, oh, that's a really great idea. The other problem is that when you're writing as a kind of secret, covert, uh, romantic idealist, um, the hyperbole the, the, that you use is going to stick on those who are already inclined to that romantic idealism. And again, those who are romantic idealists, like I'm going to be a rugged individualist. Ooh, I'm going to read about the Ubermensch because that's going to appeal to me. Or uh, uh, I want to give up the conventions of all society. So I'm going to think about the death of God. Uh, that's my romantic idealism. Each of his ideas are tainted with that. 
but I'm only presenting the bare bones idea so that we can get rid of that and we can see it for what it's worth. Thank you. Next up is going to be Phil, James, and Brian. Phil. It seems to me what you're saying is that ultimately you have to move against yourself because these ideas are embedded within you. We often think uh, that mom is the one that stands in your way of becoming who you are because you, know, you don't want to disappoint her, but actually it is you because her ideas are already embedded within you. So you have to first start with a self-struggle to liberate yourself from yourself or your past self in order to move into a possible future self, especially when the case that is not clear at the moment you're liberating yourself, that it is correct move because all of the things that you know before seem like it is the wrong move. So that's what it takes courage to do. Is that what you're saying? Yes, thank you very much, Phil. What comes to mind is, is this, look, uh, the will to power is really an idea about uh, self-empowerment by overcoming the self. The Ubermensch, if it's properly put in, in into play rather than being parody or tragedy, but rather potent philosophy is a request about the idea of transformation and metamorphosis as the central idea that the Ubermensch, something that is over human, will go through a three-stage metamorphosis. Well, the eternal recurrence is basically the recipe of that. It's a recipe of looking at conscience, trying to challenge it and overcome it and force it to progress for yourself. Thank you. Next up is James, Brian, and Mike. James. Hi, uh, Mr. Nietzsche. Yeah, in uh, the gay science, he has a... Uh, the aphorism referring to the uh, ex-priest and a released criminal who love their age. And they're making faces, you know, uh, about the future and they don't, they want to, you know, forget about the past. Is, are, the, are those, uh, uh, you know, people who uh, love their age, example of, uh, of amor fati or uh, eternal recurrence? Hmm. Yes, I'm trying to remember the passage in particular that you're speaking of. Now, there's another passage about the light my blindness. Uh, the wanderer said to a shadow, um, my, my future should tell me where I am, but it yeah. should not betray to me the things that are to come. I do not want to die having tasted the things before they were meant to. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a part of that for Nietzsche where he wants us, in order for us to address our future, it isn't so much having forethought that, let's say your fate is you're gonna die, or your fate is you're gonna get married, or your fate is that you're gonna get married and have kids, have a house and dog and all that other jazz. All these other fated things that you expect as a wish, um, Nietzsche is trying to address that the only way those things, those good things can happen is if you work at it, if you, you focus on the action of producing it. So in a lot of ways, Nietzsche is Aristotle here. Thank you. Next up is Brian followed by Mike. Brian. So I wanted to, uh, first of all, kind of comment on Laura and agree with Laura this is very dense. For me, it's always been very dense material. But I have to say, I, I said once earlier at the very beginning, I, uh, I don't think I would have gotten into philosophy at all if I hadn't stumbled across Nietzsche when I was a teenager, because you know, just one or two lines can grab you. They certainly grabbed me. And then I've uh, read it off and on over the decades. And it, yeah, it's, uh, it's a puzzlement. Uh, but, you know, I never would have come to it. The only thought, the only other thought is that uh, maybe the, you know, in that time, uh, those texts work better. Certainly they were polemic and uh, provocative, controversial, uh, even if not understood. So in, in that way, it's, uh, you know, I can see what he was, 
I kind of see what he was trying to do, even though it is, I think it's very difficult stuff. Uh, just trying to explain why it, maybe it's necessary to be difficult in the way he wrote it. Here's my thought, the, uh, or my question. Um, it's just in listening to you now, uh, Dr. Nietzsche, it, it occurs to me, well, in listening to you and reflecting on one of the texts that you read, uh, I have the following thought. The text is that when you read at the very beginning, it was about um, the eternal recurrence. And you said, consider that every moment you have lived and every moment you will live, you will live again. But then he goes on to say at the end, have you ever had such a tremendous moment that it justifies is your existence. So at one point, he's pointing at all of life, you know, every moment in your life. And then at kind of at the end, he's pointing at this uh, moment of epiphany, I'd call it catharsis or ecstasy, that somehow would justify all of this past existence. The, um, and the thought that occurred to me is that this understanding the hearing and understanding the eternal recurrence can be that cathartic moment that I don't want to use justifies the past, but that makes all future possible. Let's say justifies the past by making all future possible. Um, and in that way, it's, it's a very, and it makes, in that way, it makes further cathartic moments available to you as you try to live your life as an aesthetic experience. Would you like to comment? Thank you very much, Brian. What comes to mind is that um, even if your life has been determined by cycles, Nietzsche thinks that your disposition was on autopilot. What he wants us to do is recognize the epiphenomenal phenomenal uh, motivations that bring us to this profound moment where we go, oh, and this moment too, and all of these things happened to me, I knew they were going to happen, and all these other things are going to happen to me because I've already set those odds at play. That there's a moment where you can move from uh, epiphenomenal phenomenal form of unconscious to conscious to the point where you're able to take behind take the wheel over and drive. And that is the point of the eternal occurrence. It, it is to move you from unconscious to conscious. Thank you. Next question is from Mike. Mike, go ahead. What's your question? Uh, there seems to be uh, many uh, cyclical things in this uh, story. Um, uh, uh, I, and maybe you can comment on whether the, they apply to this. Uh, he signed the um, uh, some of his letters in Echo Homa, uh, one of his later things after he was semi-insane as the crucified. Uh, he uh, uh, um, Jesus was crucified, Zoroaster was crucified, Dionysius, which he also mentioned in several places, uh, was murdered. Uh, were, were, uh, do you feel that this is a kind of Jared Diamond thing that history definitely repeats itself or at least rhymes? Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I think we should address that uh, because part of the eternal recurrence is an admittance that Jesus is meant to come back. Uh, so in the same way that Zoroastrianism thinks that the good and bad avatars are meant to recur over and over. That the, the ending message that Zoroaster has, that is uh, have a good mind or good intention, uh, have good uh, words and good actions. That, that, was his, that was his, let's say, that was his cure for evil, was to, to have a good mind, to have good words and good deeds. That was his cure for the Ottoman to conquer it. Uh, Zoroaster believed that there would be another avatar after him who will correct 
the boat and we'll add more to this idea. And this will happen again and again and again. That is, we will always have new religious leaders who will crack open the, the egg of meaning for us culturally and uh, rearrange it so that it means something altogether very different, very new. But that requires a new language and new valuations. And that is the point that you might think of is that it's inevitable that we're going to have a new religion in the future, just as it's inevitable that we're having a new spirituality in the now. Wonderful. So folks, what we are going to do now is we are going to go to the breakout rooms. Um, breakout rooms are a critical part of these meetups because there you, you get to have a full-fledged dialogue with others. And then when you come back, uh, you know, Dan is going to talk about what we're going to do in the breakout rooms. They're going to be facilitated with people with star in their names. So it's going to be Dan, Brian, and Cho who will be facilitating the breakout rooms. And when you come back from breakout rooms, come back with your best question, the best question you have about Nietzsche's philosophy as a whole, anything, okay? We'll collect all the questions and then we're going to do a lightning round of answers. All right, so Dan, what, what do you want people to discuss in the breakout rooms? Well, I think the first question I want to, to ask is, uh, how do we understand the eternal recurrence now as a cyclical pattern that uh, it is supposed to be an existential test? The second question is, what does a mortal thought they really mean? The third is, how the hell do we live dangerously? And last, which we haven't been able to talk about, but I've hinted at, uh, is uh, what is Nietzsche's great health? Or what is Nietzsche's idea of the intellectual conscience? Now, I put, I, I put the, that up onto the chat, all four of those questions, by the way. Wonderful. All right, folks. So the breakout rooms will run for 20 minutes, after which we'll come back here automat automatically. Starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. All right. So now it's time for the lightning round of questions. All of Nietzsche's philosophy is fair game. Uh, we're looking only for questions, folks. Okay, only questions. So let's go ahead and put together all the questions. Then we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and organize all of them. And we're going to go ahead and answer them. You know, Dan will answer, but you're always welcome to answer as well. So this is the lightning round, all right? So go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to put your question on the table. This is your opportunity. Laura followed by Joe. Laura, what's your question? Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, my question is, did his insanity create his philosophy or does his philosophy create his insanity? Okay, thank you. Insanity and philosophy. Next up is going to be Joe, Allison, Jyoti, and Phil. Joe, what's your question? Um, when you're looking back at your life and analyzing it and the eternal recurrence, what is the standard that you use in order to determine whether it's been a good life or not. Oh, wonderful. Standard for good life in the context of eternal recurrence. Excellent. Next up is going to be Alison, Jyoti, and Phil. Alison. Um, is the ability to take risk innate or can you learn to take more risks? Okay. Uh, ability to task, take risk. Uh, innate or learned. Very good. Excellent. Next up is uh, Jyoti followed by Phil. If you change your karma, will that uh, transform karma become a, uh, for your recurrence in the future or it will be the same old karma? Okay, if you change your karma and would it remain the same 
Uh, can you repeat the question? I want to make sure I got it. Yeah. If you change your karma and you transform yourself, mm -hmm. will your new transform become a recurrence or it will be the karma that you had initially? Okay. Very good. Excellent question. Okay, new karma or old karma becomes recurrent. Excellent. Next up is Phil followed by Evanique and Kevin. Phil. The combination of the eternal return and living dangerously seems to signal perpetual revolution. Is this a continual revolution or is this a punctuated evolution? Okay. Which, which there is a rest period. Excellent, thank you. Um, when you combine living dangerously with eternal recurrence, what is the pattern of, um, of what, what, what did you use? Um, uh, 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 seems like a perpetual revolution. A perpetual revolution. revolution. Okay, very, very good. Is it a continual revolution, a punctuated revolution? Very good, so is the revolution punctuated or continuous? Very good. Excellent. Thanks, Phil. Uh, next up is going to be Evanique, followed by Kevin. Evanique. Uh, Dr. Nietzsche, you talk about God is dead, and then you talk about this et eternal recurrence and uh, the fact of overcoming. So my question to you is, what is it that you actually believe? Wonderful. What does Nietzsche believe? Very good. Next up is Kevin. Yeah, my question is for the Nietzsche give you four questions. What's, her, uh, what's his own answer about the four questions? He can, can he summarize those questions, the so, answer? So, no, 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 I, I didn't get that. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, uh, Nietzsche give us uh, for breakout room, break room four questions. What his own answer about? Ah, uh, then no, no, that's, that, that's like asking four questions. I know, I, I know, choose he, he can, choose his one. choice. Choose one. Okay, uh, let's let's do one thing. Let's make it question. hard. Let's no no. Let's make it hard for him. Let's give him. Let's give him the fourth question because he didn't say anything about it. Okay. okay. How about? Thank that? you. Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, all right. No more questions. Okay. We got incredible, incredibly good questions. So let me see if I can um, go ahead and uh, try to organize it. Insanity and philosophy will go later. Uh, what is the standard of good? That's that's very good related to that. Ability to take, uh, you know, uh, take chances. Is that uh, innate or is it learned? Then this is a point about karma. Uh, living dangerously. That's very interesting. Living dangerously and standard for good. Let's combine that. And what do you believe? And the last one was about great health. So we'll end up with great health because that's a great topic. Uh, so that's that that would be um, a logical way, to, high point to end at. So let's start with things connected with um, eternal recurrence. So Joe, can you repeat your question? Yeah, sure. So if we're living our life over and over again, and we're evaluating it, whether we'd fall down and or gnash our teeth and you know curse the devil for giving us our life again. But what would be the standard by which we would actually measure our life? Okay, so for, uh, folks, the format is going to be that uh, Dan can answer it, Dan will answer it, but if anybody else wants to answer this question or any question that's put on the table, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Okay, um, and if there are a exclamation marks before Dan tries to speak, then we will start with other people's and we'll wait for Dan's question in the letter. So Dan will go in, we'll make an exception for Dan. Dan will have a little bit more time. He will have about two to three minutes uh, for questions. Everybody else has under a minute for answering the questions. So it's going to be Brian, uh, Joe and Dan, Brian. So I was, uh, I, I decided to chime in because I'm very interested in the answer from Dr. Nietzsche and I have my own uh, tentative answer. Go ahead. The, um, I think if I'm understanding eternal recurrence together with amor fati, and I think they go together, if I'm understanding it correctly, 
uh, the way you understand your life at the time of your death is that the past is in the past and it's all good. The, um, now that just kind of brings me to another point just in my own life that what I see, you know, if you think about my life, uh, the older I get, the more I think, I think I just recognize there's gonna be less of the my and me and the more of the life. So if I'm thinking about, you know, when I die, I'm thinking more and more about life in general and things that go on, maybe not in eternity, I'm not so interested in that, but what, you know, after, immediately mm -hmm. afterwards, I know that life is gonna go on after me. And that's the thing that's kind of exciting for me. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Next up is going to be Joe, Jyoti, Fahad, and Phil. Joe, yes, what's your answer? I just wanted to throw my theory out is that sure. I don't think that Nietzsche gives us a standard because we're supposed to discover that ourselves. Essentially that, you know, it's just like choosing your philosophy of life. So if I choose to be a Stoic, that's fine. But if that's not your choice, that's fine. But you have to answer that question, mm -hmm. not Nietzsche. That's, but I want to know if he had an answer for it. Wonderful. I mean, that's, look, look, I mean, Nietzsche gets to uh, eavesdrop on everybody else's answers to the question. And then Nietzsche gets to talk, has his own uh, take on it, because it's very important that each of us wrestle with these questions, these questions ourselves. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. And great, great question. Um, next up is Jyoti, Fahad, and Phil. Jyoti. Yeah, I was going to respond to Joe. He responded himself. I think things that didn't pan out for you, that is your standard. You are the, you're the one who's going to set the standards for your life. Thank you. Yeah, whatever uh, didn't work out for you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Fahad. Uh, Fahad, you need to unmute. Yeah, I think that's very uh, complex. Uh, question actually but I think uh, for me personally I think um, making this life after you go you think you made this universe better you touched as many life and you created many smiles and you created many happiness and you created and you feel actually you tried your best to do that um, it goes back to the also to the same kind of question I was trying to ask. What's your kind of uh, standard um, um, good or bad or your choices, yes or no? So if you're actually looking after the whole universe or the whole world, then your happy life will, the answer would be, if I made more life happier, whether that's your immediate family or your neighbors or your co-worker or the whole universe, then you now actually had good life. Or it can be just very individualistic um, life where you had tons of pleasure, even if you ruined other people's lives, then you think you had good life. So um, yeah, that's okay. that my, my answer to that. Uh, thank you, Fahd. Next up is Phil followed by Kevin. Phil. Yeah, I, I sort of agree with Joseph, but, uh, but I want to expand it slightly. I think the answer is wrapped up in the question. In other words, within the question itself, at the end, there is an answer, and that answer comes from you because no other person could judge uh, the internal structure that you build. Thank you. Next up is Kevin, followed by Allison. Kevin. If uh, our individual is a chop of water in the sea, so I would understand it depends on how you live close to the nature. And the flow is the water, you enjoy each moment, each move. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up is going to be Allison, followed by Mike. Allison. Um, I think Emerson said it best when he said that to know that even one life has breathed easier. Wonderful. Thank you, Allison. Mike, one minute, please. Mike, I go think, ahead. I think Nietzsche said it best. He said, uh, you, it's this evil demon is coming after you saying you're going to live this life over and over and over again, have the same joys and the same pain and the same uh, uh, lack of accomplishment, the same 
imaginary accomplishments. And um, even though you don't remember your previous times on this, I don't remember what I did in grammar school real well. Um, I, I, it's your challenge to uh, throw that demon on the ground and gnash your teeth and tell him I ain't gonna take this no more. And if you do that, and even though you, it's an act of courage because you don't know, you don't really remember what happened the previous times you did this. So uh, now this goes back to Descartes' brain in a jar and the question of whether we have free will or not. And thank I you. don't know the answer. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, my answer, the way I, I, I find this concept to be really fascinating. And for me, it's kind of finding something which is very small, very few principles, very simple principles, which have kind of ability to grow into pretty much anything. That's the kind of, you know, the, the, the germ which can grow into anything is what I think of when I think of this, this idea. Um, the person who is really best at composing these things are, is Louis Sullivan. Uh, so he has many different like form follows function. He has things where you, there is this kind of continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside. Uh, as a continuous process. So what, you, what, what I'm trying to capture, or I'm always trying to capture is something which is very simple, which is a process that can allow for handling anything and kind of unlimited growth. That's, that's how I think about this. Um, next up is going to be uh, Mr. Nietzsche. All right. I just want to read a quote from Nietzsche. The future influences the present just as much as the past. Now, to give you an answer, Joe, what I would say is this. If you come across something that hasn't had a path grown onto it, then that's where the live dangerously choice is. If, it, if you look at the path that everybody has already used, the most common one, then Nietzsche would say, well, you already know what that choice is. So if you chose the other choice, the dangerous choice of carving your own path, you will still know what that other carved path is. And so now you have more knowledge. That is, you have more perspectives to work with. And that is what his idea is designed to do. And it's designed to move you from what you might think of as epiphenomenal phenomenal control over your life, over conscious control over your life, the top bottom emergence control over your life. Wonderful, thank you. Next question is going to be Phil's question. Um, when you combine the idea of living dangerously with eternal recurrence, what pattern does it produce? Of it is clearly a revolutionary pattern, but what kind of pattern? Is it punctuated or is it continuous? So folks, go ahead and type exclamation mark. If you would like to answer at a, at a broad level, when you combine eternal recurrence with living dangerously. What's the pattern? What's the result of the combination of these two ideas? If you'd like to answer, go ahead and type exclamation mark. James. Yeah, I think it uh, tends to produce a kind of a revolutionary uh, pattern because if the, if the individual sees that he's gonna live that same life over and over again, why not do something dangerous? Why not risk doing something different instead of doing the same thing over and over again? So I, I think the individual uh, <clears throat> would exercise his will to power and, and, and be able to, you know, more able to embrace that, that will to power rather than to follow the, the habitual, you know, um, <clears throat> same paths that everybody else has been following. Wonderful. Next up is Phil. Yeah, I, I, I think it's punctuated because uh, even cycles, like there is the spring and there's the winter. There's night, there's day. You know, there's all sorts of things that occur on the one hand is active, but the, on the other hand is rest. So I think it's punctuated. I think in order to maintain the cycle, 
there has to be a period of rest to build up the energy for the revolution. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Phil. Next up is Kevin. I understand for take the risk and danger like this. If you take risk now, or later on, you're going to continue to be seeing the danger. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I find this combination of living dangerously and eternal recurrence to occur in many, many different versions in many ideas that we have studied. We've talked about Jordan Peterson, about talking kind of living at the edge of order and chaos with one foot in order, one foot in chaos. Um, and punctuation is always, you go into the chaos and you reorder everything. So you come back to the order and you keep doing that uh, all the time. Uh, we've seen this in the concept of flow of taking on challenges, but challenges which are manageable and you keep growing. So there is kind of, uh, so I, I see it uh, in, in these, uh, these, and it is definitely mm -hmm. punctuated where you go way out there and then kind of come back and then go back, go back out there. All right, uh, next up is going to be Mr. Nature. You say a good cause justifies any war, but I say good wars justify any cause and not just a long-term peace, but a short peace and a short war is really what we need. This is what Nietzsche had in mind, that um, this idea that it's punctuated uh, is quite, quite compatible with our existence being determined by patterns of cycles. Uh, we had this mention of spring and winter, that, that spring, winter, summer, fall, these are these patterns. Well, war and peace are part of our own patterns. That is, it's really hard to say who you are <clears throat> without knowing the adversity for which your own self-definition is polemically tied to. So that you have to admit that war is really being warlike is part of our nature. Uh, Nietzsche says that not only you have to be a friend to your enemies, but you have to be an enemy to your friends is uh, important because of those kinds of connections. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next question is going to be uh, from Allison. Is the ability of living dangerously innate or is it learned? Anybody who wants to answer it, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Is the ability to take risks of living dangerously innate or is it learned? James followed by Jyoti, James. Yeah, the, uh, I, I think the, uh, the ability to live dangerously is innate. Uh, it's it's uh, the will to power is pervasive in nature, but uh, we have a tendency to um, be uh, uh, co-opted by by the herd, and so so that kind of uh, <clears throat> herd instinct uh, perhaps uh, overrules this kind of will to power, um, and so so that's uh, just like in society we we adapt instead of instead of um, you know, uh, cooperate rather than compete. And um, there's a, uh, you know, there's these uh, motives, you know, of uh, competition and cooperation and, um, and the will to power to um, living dangerously or is, um, you know, there. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jyoti, Joe, Dave, and Phil. Jyoti. Yeah, I think it is nature nurture theory. Mm -hmm. um, you have the drive in you to take risks because you have the DNA for it, but then you also have the environment that reinforces it. So what came first, the nature or nurture? Not sure. Thank you. Joe, Dave, and Phil. Joe. Yeah, it's essentially the same answer that uh, Jody just shared. It's, it's, it's that uh, I think it's a combination of both. It's the environment that you're in, but it is part of your DNA, uh, so to speak. Thank you. Next up is Dave, followed by Phil. 
Dave. I, I think this is one of Jordan Peterson's rule for living. Don't disturb a teenager on a skateboard. That's part of our personal development is pushing the limits. And I think, of course, for women as well for men. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is going to be Phil followed by Brian. Phil. Yeah, this is actually related to the punctuated revolution. I think it is innate, but it's also learned in this sense. You have an innate ability to take risk and pe some people have more than others, but it's also learned in the sense, I just saw in the Olympics, those uh, trick bicycle riders, it's just fantastic because while they're doing these dangerous things because they have the courage, that there's also a punctuated uh, cycle in which they criticize what they've done and how they could improve it so they could even go higher. <laughs> so it's uh, the rest, the punctuation, therefore, uh, let them, uh, in a sense, learn what they've learned in, a, in order to compute higher. So it's, it's a combination of both. Thank you, Phil. Next up is Brian. Brian, go ahead. Uh, so is the ability to live dangerously innate or learned? Uh, I think like uh, Jyoti said, I said it, I think it's both, but whatever your innate nature is, I think um, the ability to live dangerously and what I interpret that as taking risk or includes taking risk, the, uh, the ability to take risk uh, can be learned and that is how to manage risk. And that's the, Jordan Peterson pointed at that. There's the risk that hits you in the face and there's the risk that you see coming. It's, uh, you can anticipate, if you can anticipate the risk you can see coming, you can manage it better. Srikant just touched on that earlier with flow. You wanna, you can manage, you wanna embrace the manageable risk. There is definitely something about that I, there are other references, but there is definitely an important point there. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, Laura, do you think it is learned or is it innate? I'll go with innate, but I think also you may have to learn. Okay. Um, so that's my side. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nietzsche, what do you think? Um, I think this is similar to what Nietzsche says that people have to learn to love, that we often think that we have an innate sense towards affection but affection is a very raw thing. It, it, and Nietzsche thinks that um, there's a great difference between let's say a naive amateur and a maestro. And so uh, the subject has to kind of grow into not only, um, and, and this happens every time you do fall in love. When you find someone that you fall in love with, they, they turn out to be exceptions to everything. So what's your normal uh, reactions of like disappointment or grossness, you would have a tendency to put it aside because this is a new thing in your life. But when the one that you love has become more familiar, you know, like you, you buy a new car, at first you treat it like a baby. But after a while, after having driven it for a year or two, you slam its doors, you kick its tire, you curse the engine, et cetera. And in that way, you've learned to kind of love that thing. And um, this has to be true about knowing risk. That is, there is a naive person who thinks they have a handle over risk. And what is a risky choice as opposed to a naturally uh, safe choice. And then there is someone who is learning and knows the distinction between risk and safety. So. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next question is Jyoti's question. It's a complicated question, uh, but let's, let's take a swing at it. So let's say that you have a certain karma. You have a certain way of operating, which has a certain consequence. And then you actually make a change in your life, a dramatic change in your life, where you alter what you're doing, your karma changes. Does eternal recurrence refer to the karma that you've been doing for a long time or this new level or neither or both or what, what is the deal? How, how does this concept apply 
when you made a radical change in your life? Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to answer. Okay, Dave, what is your answer? Dave followed by Brian. It's going to be a third level. Okay, uh, next up is going to be Brian. The, uh, I'm sorry to be chiming in so often, but to me, this has been a very exciting session. A lot of ideas are coming together. Uh, Brian, you are welcome to chime as many times as you want. Just keep it short. That way everybody can chime in as many times as they want. Go ahead, uh, Brian. Yeah, well, this is just a reaction and the emotional kind of reaction. The, um, to me, this, this uh, presentation and understanding of ER, I think if you understand ER, uh, the eternal recurrence, then uh, what continues is the new karma. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, next up is going to be uh, Govert, followed by Phil, Laura, and James. Govert, go ahead. Uh, it depends a little bit how we interpret uh, karma. Uh, you can interpret it in a very secular way as just a law of cause and effect. Uh, you can interpret it in the more religious Indian way of cause and effect that has, you know, impact on your future life. Um, I don't think Nietzsche is, is thinking in along lines of reincarnation. Um, so in that way, the religious way or application would necess not necessarily apply. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Govert. Uh, next up is going to be Phil, Laura, and James. Phil. Uh, I've, I've been dying to give this answer, but, but it could apply to any of the questions. Uh, it's... And it's really the relationship between Mao and Cho and Lai. Mao sees the continue, continue revolution uh, with the with the uh, what is it the the, the cultural revolution, uh, and, and Cho and Lai realize that the revolution is over. It's time to have a government <laughs> to stabilize it. Right. So you have you already won the revolution. It's on a higher level now. Let's settle down and make it a government, not a provisionary government, a true government. Cho and Lai save China. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Phil. Um, now, Ronald has not spoken before, so he gets a chance to go first. Ronald, go ahead, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Ronald. It, it seems to me the definition of the urban man, the superman, keeps shifting, I, I can't get a grasp of it. So for example, I would think that, could Jesus Christ be an example of the Superman or is that wrong? Okay, thank you. We'll put that as a question at the end. Um, next up is going to be, um, let's see, Laura followed by James and James. Um, so Laura, what do you think about when you're doing something at a certain level and now you're doing it at a completely different level? What, what does eternal recurrence refer to? Well, I think it's just a, a new level. It, you've moved to a new level. It's, it's a part of the, it, it, the, all the current sort of morphs to a new occurrence, which will be, can, become part of the uh, continue, uh, um, continued occurrence. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be James. Yeah, I think you have to uh, tie uh, eternal recurrence with the will to power so that uh, the will to power will, um, it will start to overcome the, the levels that you were at before. You mentioned karma. So I, 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 I think the, the, over, uh, the overman uh, overcomes that kind of karma and goes to a higher level at each level of, at each um, phase of the eternal recurrence. Thank you, thank you. Uh, in Hindu um, religion, they believe that, you know, the karma determines what you come back as when you are reincarnated. And I think Mr. Nietzsche has done pretty well to be reincarnated as Dan. So let me go ahead and move, <laughs> it, move it to Dan. Dan, go ahead. So I wanna kind of leave Nietzsche here for a moment because 
I think there's a wonderful thing to point out. If, if you're familiar with the work Bhagavad Gita, you know in the second uh, song, Krishna turns to Arjuna and he says, look, this evil uncle of yours, he's been on this battlefield before, an infinite amount of times before, and so have you, and we have brought you as an avatar to stand up against him, and we expect you to strike him down, take over his kingdom, and, and rule justly, and Arjuna's response is, I can't, because I'll poison my karma by striking down my, my uncle. <clears throat> Krishna said, no, no, this is part of the cycle. This is part of karma anyway. That is, he was meant to rise in the same way that he was meant to be evil. His part to play in all of this and your part to play in all of this is fated. That even though you're trying to move around your fate, you're going to find that fate anyway. And I think this is very similar to the way that Nietzsche says, what does your conscience say to you? You shall become who you are. This is a this is a a, a Pindar saying. In fact, uh, the play, the playwright, the Greek playwright Pindar. This is a saying from him that says that um, no matter what the circumstances are, if your if your character is determinate, that is, you have a certain disposition, it's predictable what your response is going to be. If you want to get out of that. You have to turn to the eternal recurrence to break the cycle. That is the point of the eternal recurrence. It's designed to be a test to break all of those cycles, all of those patterns for you. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so, folks, we are now going to do three more questions. The first one is going to be very brief. What does Nietzsche believe in? Maximum one sentence, preferably one word, if you can do it. If you want, two or three words you can take it but just one sentence is the maximum okay so that's that's the first question then we are going to look at insanity and philosophy and then we are going to do the finale on great health the concept of great great health all right so what does meter mr nietzsche believe in as short as you possibly can make it Evanik. christianity James. Uh, James. Can I ask the question? What uh, uh, it's that, um, uh, what Nietzsche believes in? Yes, that's the question. What does Nietzsche believe in? Answer in one word to one sentence. Okay. Um, Nietzsche believes in the will to power, but uh, does that contradict or or uh, serve for eternal recurrence. Next up is going to be uh, Joe. So it's going to be Joe, Dave, Jyoti, Katie, Allison, and Govert. Joe, what does Nietzsche believe in? Living your authentic life and overcoming your challenges. Wonderful. Dave, what does Nietzsche believe in? The pen is mightier than the sword. Next up is Jyoti, Katie, Allison, Govert, Phil. Jyoti. What goes around comes around unless you want to change it. Thank you. Katie. Um, breaking from tradition. Okay, I will answer will. Next up is Allison, Govert, and Phil. Allison. Think, think for yourself. Thank you. Govert. Uh, the intensification of the creative experience of life by experimenting with one's own values. Wonderful. Wonderfully put. Thank you. Next up is going to be Phil, Laura, and Mr. Nietzsche. Phil. Personal responsibility. Thank you. Laura, in one word to three words, what does Nietzsche believe in? Take responsibility for yourself. Wonderful. Mr. Nietzsche, what do you believe in? There are no rationalizing principles of existence. And art is the only task of life. Wonderful. Wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. 
Uh, let me see. Uh, next up is going to be a very tough question that was posed to Mr. Nietzsche, but let everybody answer it. Now you can answer, this one is a complex one, so you can take a few sentences. Um, so the question is, did insanity of Mr. Nietzsche led, lead to his philosophy or does his philosophy lead to his insanity? Uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to answer the question next up. Uh, I kind of lost track here. Give me a second, give me a second. I don't know where, where this one begins. Allison, did you have something? Uh, Katie, did you have something on this one or previous one? Katie? Uh, no, I don't have anything on this one. Okay, Allison. I'm starting to think that Nietzsche wasn't insane. It was more that the rest of society was insane. Wonderful. Next up is Govert. Um, there's not much of a, a connection there. Um, he did go insane in 1890, but it had to do with uh, a conflation of um, inherited dispositions. His father, for example, had gone uh, a little mad, uh, something they called then the, uh, uh, the soft brain or something like that. Uh, so he had a fear. He, he had a profound fear because his father and other people had gone mad. Um, he might have contracted uh, syphilis that might have undermined his brain also. Um, but he had a breakdown in 1890, um, and, and it was, was kind of an overextended sense of empathy towards a horse that was beaten very badly by its owner, and, and he just broke down in empathy and, and somehow never got out of it. So there is the idea that maybe in the last two productive years of his life, between 1888 and 1890, there will have been some influence of, of you know, uh, some brain damage kind of things on his writing. But before that, it was more the fear of being insane. That, that, that might have been a, an, an undercurrent in his life. Um, but afterwards, it was very, you know, yeah, very sorry state for 10 years uh, when he was being taken care of by his family, by his mother and by his sister. Thank you. That's Thank you, Gold. Thank you, Gold. Uh, thanks, thanks for all, all of that. Uh, next up is going to be Joe, uh, Evanique, and Phil. Joe. Um, I think that his philosophy actually led to his insanity. I mean, essentially at some point. Thank you. Next up is Evanique, followed by Phil. Evanique. I think it's both. I think it was cyclical kind of. I think... Uh, his philosophy, I think his philosophy led to his insanity. And it was because of his insanity that he had his philosophy, because it seems so contradictory. His philosophies, I think it just it just seems like it's just both. It's a combination. Wonderful. Uh Phil. Uh, uh I think the problem is our definition of insanity. I think sometimes we mis mistake uh creativity for insanity. So we have to def redefine what insanity is. Thank you. Next up is Brian. Uh, I don't think his insanity led to philosophy or the other way around, but I think his sickness, his lifelong sicknesses definitely influenced his philosophy. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for Nietzsche. Um, and I think he did something right. He did something wrong. Uh, to summarize it in his own terms, he was, I think he was a lion. He was a lion mm. and not yet fully child. He could kind of grasp what a child is, but not, he was not there. He was, he was a lion. And his greatness was to say no. And his limitation was to say only no, uh, too much of no. So he didn't, didn't fully grasp the entire, you know, power of reality, power of institutions, that's the net sum of everything that the culture has produced. 
um, that was his limitation. And that I think led to a lot of problems with him. But at the same time, his great achievement was that of a will of seeing, saying no to a lot of things which were taken, which were actually taken, taking a lot of toll on everybody's life. He had the honesty and courage to do that. And um, so I, I see him as being harbinger of a new age, you know, starting of a new age. And that's why he's, um, he's a great figure. And that's why I'm just delighted to be discussing him. So he has major problems. And what happens is that I give a lot of slack to people who are innovators, because when they break new ground, many times they have to kick things. Uh, that is the only way they have to be, they have to have the courage to say no. And sometimes you say no to too many things, uh, too many connected things that you should not say no to. Um, so so I, I see it as a mixed, a mixed uh, character, uh, but, but that's, my, that's my take. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin followed by Mr. Nietzsche. Yeah, because uh, people, uh, he is say no to most things, lots of things. That's where Peter, people say he is crazy. Uh, he is, you know, you said, that's uh, maybe we are crazy. So let's uh, yes. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, thank yes. you. I mean, uh, you know, the child points out that emperor has no clothes and he did that a lot. And I'm really grateful uh, to him for that. Mr. Nietzsche, what do you have to say for yourself? Two things. First thing, <clears throat> insanity is rare in individuals, but in parties, states, and nations, it's the rule. Okay. Second, my task is to make the individual uncomfortable. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so now we're going to go for the big question that we did not get to go uh, talk about. So Mr. Nietzsche, you have got about five minutes. If you could talk about what you mean by great health. Thank you, thank you, Shri Khan. Um, let's begin <clears throat> with what the eternal recurrence is about. It's about conscience, essentially. Nietzsche is building an intellectual conscience. And in order to build an intellectual conscience, he wants to bring in several different key factors. The Nietzsche idea that Nietzsche has is that, um, uh, which is similar to his passage 106, that is the, the, the innovator and the disciple. The disciple is going to say everything they have in mind against the innovator's creation. And so the idea of a great health is to take a healthy individual and expose them to sickness so that they can grow. That is, as Nietzsche says, in order for a tree to grow vast and wide, it needs storms, it needs worms, it needs nastiness, and it needs sickness. It needs adversity to express itself in the way it's supposed to. And in order to do that, Nietzsche wants us to gain a new sense of psychological conscience. And that is found in the eternal recurrence, where it's a question about choosing a good choice that makes you feel okay with, as opposed to choosing a other choice that makes you feel regret. So, in order to understand that, Nietzsche wants to say, you have to overcome your fate by acknowledging it. That is, as Nietzsche says, the future has as much influence over the present that the past does. If not, the past has more influence over the present and more influence even over the future. And in order to get the individual to be untied by that, the individual has to experiment with their life. They have to live dangerously this way because it's designed to make them grow, which is what Aristotle's eudaimonia man is all about, to grow, grow, and grow. In order to gain that, you have to set a very high ideal, a great health. 
Wonderfully put, wonderfully put. So thank you very much. So this was a fantastic meetup. And uh, this is a great point to end it up uh, end it on. But I'm going to, uh, so I'm going to stop the recording now.